As we go to God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, give us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that your word may be faithfully preached to the honor of your name and to the edification of your church. Help us to receive your word with the humility and obedience which it deserves. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to the book of Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. If you're using the Pew Bibles, most of them you'll find that on page 766. Isaiah is between the books of the Song, Song of Solomon and Jeremiah. And Isaiah 42, and I want to read from Isaiah 42, and we're going to look particularly at verse 16. Uh, but I'll read verses 10 through 17 so we get some of the context of this verse. But again, we'll be focusing on verse 16 together this morning. So Isaiah chapter 42, beginning at verse 10, let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice to the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Sela sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Again, we want to focus our attention particularly on verse 16. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. Um, I wanted to think about this verse with you, given what's gone on in the life of our church this week. Um, as we got news of the death of one of our uh, longtime members, Mrs. Olinda McCrory, as we heard about Sirius illness and hospitalization, the Gordon family, I thought, I don't know that I just want to continue to go through our regular schedule in Proverbs, uh, but I thought it might be helpful for us as we think about these things together uh, to think about a verse that offers great encouragement uh, to those who seem to be in darkness and don't see a way forward. Uh, that really what this is what this verse is all about. Um, and so as the week went on, I just thought I would rather share with you about this verse and think about this verse together, given what's going on in the life of our church, then just continue our normal series. This is a verse that's become very precious to me. Uh, this is a verse that I go to often in life if I don't know the way forward. Um, it was very, a very helpful verse for me when I was thinking about accepting the call to this congregation. I got myself into a place where I didn't know whether the Lord wanted me to stay where I was or leave. I didn't seem to, and it didn't seem to be to me that I could find any way of clarity going forward. And that's when in God's providence I came to this verse. And it speaks directly to when you feel like you're in the darkness and it doesn't look like there's a way forward. This is a verse that came to God's people in difficult circumstances. Um, and whether it's a decision of life that we don't know or just the circumstances of life that are difficult before us or uh, dark times. There are always verses in the Bible that speak to people that are in a similar situation. And God's people in Isaiah's day were definitely being prepared for something similar. 
Uh, Isaiah was talking about the day of Babylonian captivity that would come, preparing God's people for that inevitable day, and not just preparing them for that discipline that God was going to visit for uh, their covenant failures, but also to remind them of his ultimate promise that for the sake of the covenant he made with their fathers, they would not leave them in the darkness. He would not leave them in captivity, but he would come to them and he would rescue them. Uh, He had promised that all the way back in Deuteronomy 30 to God's people. Uh, Moses had told them, the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. One of the the things that the prophets did was bring to God's people not just the requirements of the covenant but also to remind them of those covenant promises that God had made, uh, that God would not fail to fulfill his promise. Um, And as the prophets prophesied and as they revealed God's will, they often revealed to God's people that the promises of restoration were far greater than just earthly promises. That under the cover of these earthly promises, there there were also spiritual promises being made to God's people. And that there were times when the prophets spoke about those days of restoration and spoke of them in days that would restore far beyond just the earthly needs that God's people had, but restore them in a spiritual way. And that's what this passage is really about. Uh, the promise that God would restore simply beyond the earthly difficulties they face and meet spiritual needs and go far beyond what his people could hope or imagine. And so we want to seek the hope that God offers to his pilgrim people in this verse. Um, We want to think about it in terms of what it teaches us about hopeless desperation, about heavenly intervention, and about holy dedication. That's how we want to think about this verse together. It teaches us about hopeless desperation, heavenly intervention, and holy dedication. This passage paints us a picture of a people who are in a hopelessly desperate situation. Uh, They are desperate because of what is true about them themselves. Uh, What is the problem the the people are experiencing in this verse? Well, there are internal difficulties they are facing, difficulties in themselves. Um, They are blind. If you are where you don't want to be and need to get somewhere else, it's hard to get there if you're blind. Um, There's a reminder here that that God's people are physically incapable of bringing themselves out of where they are and where they want to be. Um, It it points us to our own incapacities. They they can't go because they're blind. They're also intellectually incapable of going. They don't know the way. They're ignorant of where they need to go. It's bad enough to be blind, to be unable to to go forward. It's worse when you don't know where to go, Um, when you're ignorant of what is the path to go. There's a way they don't know that they have to walk on. This is one of the ways that we know in in this verse that Isaiah is talking about something more than just the way back to Israel, the way back to an earthly promised land. People in Babylon who were in captivity, they knew the way home. Uh, Most of them, if you'd have asked them, they could have told you which direction was home. Uh, The faithful, like Daniel, when they prayed, where did they look? They looked to where the temple had stood. They prayed towards Jerusalem. And so probably even the children of the faithful could have pointed you in the direction of home. They could have said, there's where the temple lies. There's home. There's Jerusalem. And the road to to home was well known. It was a well-traveled road. So the fact that Isaiah speaks here about a way they do not know shows that he's talking about a different road, about a different way. In the Old Testament, when they talked about a way that you did not know, it was always a new way. In particular, it was the way that it was described, the exodus from Egypt and the way to the promised land. That was a way they did not know. 
That was a new way, a way that promised a new life at the end of it. It's the way of speaking in the Old Testament about God's way of deliverance. The problem is the people don't know that way themselves. They are blind, they are ignorant, they can't find the way themselves. They are desperate in themselves and they're desperately in a hopeless situation because of the external difficulties they face. They're blind and they don't know the way. And how is the way described in verse 16? It's a dark way, right? There's darkness before them. It's a difficult way because it's dark. It's a difficult way because it's crooked. It's a rough way. Um, All of these things you see are, are being piled up by Isaiah to show the difficulty that God's people face. We are external, internally facing difficulties. We are blind and ignorant. And even if we knew the way and could see the way, the way is dark and difficult. Um, this is a, a passage for people who are in the midst of this kind of situation. It's a passage for pilgrim people who feel at times that there are moments on the pilgrimage where there is a hopeless situation. We can't stay where we are but we don't know the way forward. And sometimes that comes to us because of our own internal difficulties. Sometimes it comes because of our own struggles with sin, our own lack of love for God, our own lack of love for our neighbor, the difficulties we create for ourselves. Sometimes we face the struggles of our flesh, the decisions that face us, sickness, grief, anxiety, depression, all of those struggles that we face inside of ourselves. And God's people face all kinds of external difficulties in this world, all kinds of darkness, all kinds of rough places that make our lives difficult, the difficulties we face in our families, in our church, in our nations, in our, in our nation, in our world that make life difficult for God's pilgrim people. And there are going to be times we feel the hopelessness and the desperation of this text. Lord, I don't know where to turn. And even if I did know where to turn, I'm too blind to find my own way. The way's too dark and the way's too difficult. Um, This is a desperate situation, and it's particularly at these times that God's people need to be reminded that we are not left blind and ignorant alone in the dark. That God comes to those who are in a helplessly desperate situation and intervenes. The hope that's communicated in this passage is the deliverance that God offers, the heavenly intervention that comes to people who are in this hopelessly desperate situation. The good news is that God's people have a helper, have a divine helper, who, as one person put it, caters to our personal incapacities, overcomes our ignorance, and removes all barriers. What does the Lord say to the blind in this passage? He says to the blind, I will lead them. I will lead them. That's a very tender picture that our God gives us here. He could have said, to the blind I will give sight. Um, He's already spoken that way, and if we looked back at verse 7, which we didn't read, that was the promise that the servant of the Lord brought with him, that he would open the eyes of the blind. That was one of the ways Jesus was shown to be the servant of the Lord, come in the flesh. That was the sort of indisputable proof of his of his being that servant that Isaiah looked for because no one else in the history of God's people had given sight to the blind. And when John the Baptist in his frustration sent from prison to ask, are you the one we're looking for or are we looking for another one who is the Christ? What did Jesus say first for his disciples to tell John? Go and tell him that the blind see, that the lame walk, um, that the poor have good news preached to them. Um, the blind see. God could have said here the blind see. That could be the hope of the blind. But what does God say? What is the picture that he gives us here? I will lead the blind. That's a very tender picture. 
I don't know if you've ever led a blind person before. Well, when I was in college, my faculty advisor in the history department was blind. Um, and at a couple occasions, he asked me to lead him somewhere. It's a big responsibility when you start leading someone who can't see. You start realizing you have to pay attention to everything that's around for there. It, it's, it's a position of trust. It's a position of care. And that's what God says. And it's a particularly tender picture here because here is the same almighty God that lays waste to mountains in verse 15, who dries up pools. This is the God who is huge and almighty and august in power. And what is he willing to do? He's willing to come down and lead the blind. Our God, for all his might, for all his glory, is not above condescending to come down and to lead his people by the arm, to meet our incapabilities and to lead us. It's a wonderfully intimate picture of what God does for his people, that he comes and he leads the blind, that he's willing to come and to cater to our incapacities and to lead us through them. He comes to the blind and he leads them. He comes to the ignorant and guides them. I will guide you on the way that you do not know. Um, Again, that's a reference to the way of deliverance, the way that led to rest, the way that led home. And it's a terrible thing to know that such a place exists and not know how to get there. And it's a wonderful thing that God comes to us and says, you don't have to worry about how to get there because I will lead you there. I will guide you there. The way you don't know, the way to deliverance and rest that you can't find yourself, I will take you there. And given the context of the Old Testament, this is a promise of a new exodus, a new way, a new way home, a new way to rest. And it's a wonderful thing to know that God leads his people in the way they didn't know. That can make us think of John 14 where Jesus makes wonderful promises to his people and the disciples are afraid they don't know the way. I think of Jesus' words in John 14, verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare, prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. I will guide you on the way that you don't know. Of course, what did Thomas ask? Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What a wonderful thing to have as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a guide on the way that we don't know who is himself the way to rest and to hope. We don't have to be a people who worry that we don't know the way to rest. We have a God who's willing to bring us to rest. If that was all that God promised to do, that would be glorious. Uh, But that's not all that God promises to do in this passage. He promises to clear away not only the difficulties in ourselves, but any difficulty in the world that would keep us from finding our way home. The promises of divine help just become more glorious in this passage. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. It's not just that God will meet the difficulties we have in ourselves. It's that God will make it so that the way before us will be cleared so that we find our way to him. And these are things that only he can do. Who can make the darkness light? except our God? Who can make the rough places, the crooked places of this world level except our God? Who can straighten our paths before us? It's God's promise that nothing will keep you from me and my rest. If there's anything in this world that threatens your your progress to come to me, I will clear it away so that you come safely home. One commentator said, this is a picture of total, radical, all-embracing change. The majestic change that will occur when the Lord acts. The magnitude of what is to be accomplished is almost unbelievable 
for it is a work impossible to man. This is the hope of our pilgrimage always. That whatever the difficulties that we have in ourselves, whatever difficulties face us in the world, God will clear them away so that his people come safely home. That is the promise to pilgrim people. That God does not lead us out of slavery to sin to make us find our own way home. I've freed you, now you figure out how to get, your, get, your, you get yourself home. That's not what God does for his people. He brings us safely home. I love how Paul expresses that confidence in 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That was someone who knew the truth that God guides people who are blind and ignorant of the way to go. That God will turn the darkness before them into light and the rough places into level ground. Our God does this for his people. If we don't know where to go, he will guide us. If the way is dark and full of difficulties, he will enlighten our paths. He will smooth our way. He will see to it that we come safely home. That's the promise of our God. And not just an earthly promised land that they thought of in Isaiah's day, but the heavenly promised land where our Lord Jesus Christ is now and where all who love him and know him will be one day. And we can be assured of this heavenly intervention because of God's holy dedication to his people. Um, One of the wonderful things that we can read and know is that God will do these things and, and we can face our difficulties in the world and say, can we really be sure of that? I mean, Isaiah is very sure. Paul is very sure. How can we be so sure that these things will come? Because there are great difficulties in the world. There are great difficulties in the world. There are great difficulties in me. How can we be so sure that God will do these things? Because of his dedication to his promises. That's how we can be sure. God is dedicated to these things. I love the end of verse 16. These are the things I do. And I do not forsake them. These are the things I do. And I do not abandon them. Um, in, if we wanted to really take it woodenly from the Hebrew, it's, it's sort of these things, I do them and I do not abandon them. These things, I do them and I do not abandon them. This is who God is. God is a God who leads the blind. God is a God who guides people in the way. God is a God who lightens darkness. God is a God who clears away difficulty. That's who he is. These are the things I do, he says. And I do not forsake them. God's people's hope has always been his dedication to his cause. His dedication to his promises. Because our dedication goes like this. I'm really dedicated at some times. I'm not so dedicated at other times. I let all kinds of things in this world distract me. I get too distracted by the news. I get too distracted by what's going on in my own life. I get too distracted by all kinds of things that take my gaze away from what God is doing, what God has promised to do. And there are times that that needs to be cleared away and we need a clear vision of his dedication that doesn't wax hot and cold. The dedication that is always the same and remains for his people always. I think maybe the New Testament equivalent of the end of verse 16 is Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the great hope of God's people. That verse came to Hebrew Christians who had a former generation of faithful leaders that were gone and they were facing challenges to their faith, challenges to their endurance, and they needed a lot of both to face what they were facing and their former generations of leaders were gone and they were looking around and saying, how are we going to find the way forward in in this age? How are we going to find our way forward in this era? And it's precisely at that point that we read these words. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't matter what our circumstances are. He is always the same. 
what he does is always the same. His inexhaustible resources are always the same for his people. Who he is today is who he was for people in former generations. God is always the same in Christ for his people. That's why it's important to know today that the same Lord who is today is the same Lord who was yesterday. The same Lord who triumphed over death by his cross. Triumphed over the grave by his resurrection. Is seated at the right hand of his heavenly father. That God is still God. That Lord is still Lord. What Jesus was to those who have gone before, he will also be to those who follow in their footsteps. That's what one commentator said. Why? Because these are the things I do, God says. These are the things I do. I'm the same today as I was yesterday. And I'll be the same tomorrow that I've been. It's sort to drive this home, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He makes use of both his name and his title. Um, it's only the second time in the whole book of Hebrews he does that, to drive home the truth. Jesus Christ, the Jesus who came into the world to save sinners, the Christ, the one who was anointed by his Father with the Holy Spirit to be prophet, priest, and king. He is the same today as he was yesterday, and he will be the same tomorrow. Forever he will be this one. In him God's people have all they need and all they will ever need. He will be the same Lord every day hereafter. Commentator said, the same Christ who is with them is with you. And he will be with those who come after us, even to the end of the age. Yesterday he was with the fathers. Today he is with you. And he will be with the church and your posterity forever. Everyone who reads these words can be assured that Jesus Christ will give all that we need. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says to us, these are the things I do. And I do not forsake them. These are the things I've always done. These are the things I will always do. And I will not forsake them. That's the hope that we have. That's the hope that God's people can always have, no matter where the darkness they find themselves in this world. Jesus never promised us an easy life. Jesus never promised us that the way would be easy for Christians. In fact, his word was quite the opposite. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the way is, gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Or in Mark 8, 34 and 35, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will save it. Um, people are lying who say that following Christ means an easy life. He didn't promise that. Um, he doesn't owe it to us. What does he promise to us? That wherever you find yourself in difficulty, I will be there with you. As one who knows what it is to be in darkness and who knows the way out. Who knows the way out to light and life. He will be with us always to the very end of the age. He doesn't promise that we won't be in darkness and difficulty. What he promises is that in darkness and difficulty, he will be there. And that he will not forget his promise. To lead those who are blind. To guide those who don't know the way on the way that they must go. To make the darkness before them light. And to make the rough places a smooth place. And he says to us, these are the things I do and I do not forsake them. And the good news is that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. May he be our hope in the midst of difficult days. Amen. Let's pray together.
Our Father in heaven, we know what Jesus has said about the Christian life, and we sometimes find ourselves surprised that what he said is true. Surprised that we find ourselves in difficulty on account of our own incapacities or our own ignorance or the circumstances we face in this world. May this passage be a comfort to us that when we find ourselves in places where we don't know the way forward and where all seems hopeless, that you will meet us in our need. That in our blindness, you will take us by the arm and guide us. That you will lead us on the way that we don't know. And that where there is darkness before us, you will make it light. That where there are rough places before us, you will make it smooth until we come home. We praise you that these are the things that you do and how thankful we are that you do not forsake them. May our trust always be in our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and hear us. As a song of response, let's take up our Psalter hymnals and turn to number 66B, and we'll stand and sing together all the verses of 66B. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with you all. Amen. People of God, go in peace.